and ignore the pleadings of the Holy Spirit walking alongside you, telling you you need to surrender to Jesus Christ. Only unforgivable sin is to die and not admit that Jesus is the promised Messiah and to not surrender your life to him. That is the only unforgivable sin. Therefore, who tells you to hurry up and die? Would you just get it over with? The devil. Why? Because he wants you to die as quickly as possible. Before you come to your senses and go to heaven instead. <laughs> right. So I am opposed to it um, on, on those grounds. But let me go back to before uh, most of you were born back in the 1990s. I, I, Susie smiling. She doesn't even remember. Maybe she's too young. Um, we had a gentleman by the name of Dr. Jack Kevorkian, and he um, he went about um, uh, you know uh, uh, quote unquote assisting people to die. Well, I think in an obnoxious way. Paul. In a very obnoxious way. Uh, yes. Thank you for adding that. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I know you weren't planning on dating him. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, he, you know, his, his paintings, I think, revealed something about his spirit. Notice what I said, his spirit. Not his character, but the spirit that dwells within him. They had names like Comer and Nosh and Death. His paintings were dark and they were, it's kind of like the movies we have today, they're all dark and they're about dark themes. It tells you something about the spirit of the people in Hollywood. Their spirit is dead and they're inhabited by not nice spirit. Um, his, uh, his problem was he got into trouble and he lost his medical license when he suggested that <coughs> the people who are uh, he assisted to die, that organs should be harvested for other people. Um, uh, first of all, that sounds um, pecuniary, in my, in my opinion. I mean, this is what goes on in communist China. You get into prison for jaywalking, and then they do a DNA typing on you, and they find out that you have a perfect kidney that matches, and all of a sudden, the death penalty imposed for jaywalking. I'm opposed to that. I, I, I don't like the idea of giving man the power. It, it comes down to something even more basic than that. Who determines the date of your birth? And who determines the date of your death? Therefore, notice that none of you said Jack Kevorkian. <laughs> Why is that? Because he's not God. He's definitely um, a lot of, as I said to you, three out of four Americans believe that they have a right to assist the suicide. I disagree. I'm not into facts. You must have figured that out by now. I don't care if you think there are 200 genders. I really don't care. I don't care if you think that the Palestinians are a wonderful, peace-loving group of people. I don't care what you think. God has said, has chosen Israel. And as I've explained to you, the Jews are not special when God said, you know what? I can't help myself. You know, these people are so wonderful, so cute, I can't help myself. No. The, the God first chose the Jews. Then they became special. It's not the other way around. Here's the issue for me. If you have a problem with the Jews being the chosen people of God, your problem is not with the Jews. Your, your problem is not with the chosen. Your problem is with the chooser. And I suggest you take up your complaint with the chooser. Do me a favor and make sure you're not standing next to me when you take up your complaint. <laughs> I have a severe allergy to lightning bolts. Very severe. So just make sure that you, you're not standing next to me. But your problem is the chooser. You are you are upset that he didn't choose you. How can they talk about the two state solution? <laughs> Still. It, it, you know, it, I think it's in Judges 11. I'm 
pretty sure it's Judges 11. Um, if I'm wrong, it's Judges 9. The two-state solution was tried, and it didn't work. Read it again. If you read Judges, it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. So. Well, wait a minute. Well, they yes. sort of tried it. They were, they were being. True. They were, the Palestinians were working in Israel. They had a transfer program for working on the right. And then the Palestinians came back by coming in and slaughtering them. Right. Uh, yes. Oh, the two state solution was trying to judges? Yes. The, but there weren't Palestinians. Are you talking about the Philistines? No. no. The Amorites, the, um, the, uh, the, the Amorites, the Moabites, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm a Ikes, yeah. <laughs> they uh, came to, I believe it was Jephatha, I believe, was the judge at the time. And they said, uh, just give us back our land and we'll have peace. Jephatha did not go for it. I can look it up at the end of the class, but you can check. It's either Judges, I think it's Judges 11. Yeah. It is? Okay. Read Judges 11 when you go home, and you will see there is a two-state solution. They're saying, we'll just live side by side with you, and you can live over here, and we'll all get or get along. Where have I heard that before? No. So, as I said, my problem, getting back to the issue of euthanasia, you say, well, why would God want people to suffer? First of all, I can tell you that sometimes the only time we will listen to God is when we are in suffering. I can tell you from observing people and from personal experience, you just don't pay attention when everything is going very well. You know, when I came to, to this country, I was really blessed by the fact that, you know, I had a lot of very wealthy patients in my practice. I had, I'd say about 25% of my practice, they didn't care about insurance. They just asked, what's the bill? They paid it. You know, hospital bill, no problem, they paid it. One of the things I noticed about and well, I'm thinking of one particular lady in particular. She, when I was in my 30s, she was in her 80s, so she obviously would be dead by now. Um, she had a grandson. He grew up in complete and absolute luxury. Never had to worry about anything. His greatest uh, uh, torment for the entire year was April 15th, when his accountant who prepared all the paperwork just said, just sign here, sign there, sign there, so we can send this to the IRS. And he said that was so taxing on them. He had to go to the, to the, the family owned a 1,500 acre ranch in Australia. He just needed to go there to relax. He said, how did they sign all these papers? It was just too much. Now, let me ask you this question. You say, why does God put us through that? Because some of us just well, won't listen until God gets our attention. But let me ask you a more fundamental question. Who would you rather get advice from, Job or the grandson of that wealthy lady? Job, right. Why? Because he has been through the fire. That wealthy kid is as soft as ever. And unfortunately, I watched him make a whole bunch of really bad decisions. He didn't acquire the money. He went to university, and the only reason he passed through university is that his grandfather's name is on the football stadium. Does that tell you what the professors were told when he came to school? Yeah, you're going to pass him no matter what. I don't care if he dies in class, he's graduating. Okay. So, I understand people say, well, that's not nice of God. Why doesn't he just make our lives all easy and all pleasant and everything just wonderful? not going to work. Do you have kids? <laughs> All right. And you think if you made your kids' life super easy, they're going to turn out to be just wonderful Christians? Yeah. So. And us neither. We need some polishing. And God said, you're not ready for heaven. We need to polish you yes. more. <laughs> yes, young lady. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I, I just want to I'd like to bring up another reason for 
for suffering? Yes. It said if suffering comes with with the original sin of death, death Correct. illness is a part of death. Death came into the world through yes, by sin. By, the, by sin right. and and that's not God's will that we suffer. Correct. It it was it was the uh, it was the secondary plan based on Plan B, yes, because of Adam. Yes. Yes. And Eve. Well, yes. Eve was deceived. Eve was tricked. Adam made a deliberate choice to disobey God. Why? I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want to be alone. Maybe he wanted to be with his wife. He thought his wife was more. I don't know. But he made the wrong choice. That I can tell you. Whatever his reasons for making that choice, he made the wrong choice. So, when you look at chapter 9, you say, how could God be so cruel and allow people not to die in their suffering? He's giving them time to accept that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And that if you believe that, that he is, and you give him your life, you give him the steering wheel of your life, you will be saved. You will have eternal life. And you have, either you believe that promise or you don't. But I believe the reason that the people are not dying in chapter 9 when they want to die is because God is giving them another chance. And he certainly is the God of, of, of multiple chances. I gave you in, in the text six reasons, I think it was six, as to why I think um, it's wrong for me as a doctor to us get involved in assisted suicide. I've had people come to me with the request and I told them, I don't do it. You need to go find another doctor. Um, Are doctors still doing it? In uh, Oregon, California, quite a few states, it is legal. Now in California, they soften the proposition so that a doctor can opt out. Because if he didn't, there was going to be a massive lawsuit. Uh, 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 I'm not sure what the laws are in Oregon, but there are many states that now allow assisted suicide. Um, I don't believe that man has the right to determine that. As I told you before, God knows the date of your death. And if you decide that you're going to jump off the Empire State Building, you're going to live until the very day God says you're supposed to die. Now, you'll be a cripple, you might be in coma, you might be in several pieces. But you're going to live until the day God has determined you will die. If you, you ever assist, assist someone to die, does that make you a murderer? In my opinion, it does. But in, 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 you know, we are living in a time when people say assisting someone to commit suicide is not murder. <coughs> Stealing less than a thousand dollars is not theft. When you're playing God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the problem. Yes. Yes, yes, maybe. How about people at the end of the life and the doctor gave them more hoping? That's different. That, that's a different situation. You're, you're describing a hospice situation. I served as a medical director for a hospice, uh, actually a nationwide hospice. And um, I don't have a problem with that for two reasons. Number one, if the person is in pain or they, they have what we call terminal agitation, Morphine happens to be one of the best drugs to calm them down. That does not kill the person. That simply relieves their pain without question, and it gives them a calm mood. Uh, morphine resembles a, a, a neurochemical in the brain called endorphin, and uh, uh, that is what activates. When you inject heroin, you get an endorphin rush to the brain, and you feel really good. Okay. And so that's, I have no problem with that at all. No. Heroin? No. No, 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 no. Uh, when you take heroin and it gets to the liver, the liver converts heroin to morphine. So the, the drugs are not alike chemically and in, in, in power to form in, in your hands. But when it gets to your liver, they're the same. Um, reason number um, one. I, yes. Uh -huh. Question two. Yes. I just. And this is a question I've had in my mind. Yes. And I kind of have a 
conclusion in my mind, but I'd like to hear your, uh -huh. your, you know, I just, I, I go over 9-11 every year with uh -huh. my students. Right. And there's a, there's a part of what happened there um, where the people are jumping out of the building. Yes. Uh, and if they didn't jump, they would be burned to death right. they had within a, a few more minutes. Within a few moments anyway, yes. But at the same time, they are choosing a bear, a shorter whatever. They, you, I, you I, I think I, they're, they're actually ending their life just a, just a couple minutes early yes. by choosing the method of jumping. I don't know what you think. I tend, to, I tend to look at that as people basically wanting to escape the fire, death by fire. I don't really see them choosing so much to jump out of a, of a tall building and they know they're gonna hit the ground and die. It's really a question of how would you like to die? You see, these people are gonna die. Yeah. The question is how are you going to die? Um, I am not afraid of death. I am afraid of the, because I know the destination. You see, death for me is a destination and it's a, it's a, a, a divider between this time, this world we live in time and eternity, which is on the other side of the doorway. So death is the doorway. I'm not afraid of the destination because I know exactly where I'm going. What I am afraid of is dying the process, yes. not death the destination. And therefore, I the way I see it, I wouldn't like to die by being eaten alive by a mountain lion. I mean, okay, I mean, no, you say, okay, you, you know, if somebody's shooting at you and you're running into the, towards a mountain lion, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I probably would take the bullet to the head, you know. So I, I tend to see the people who jumped out of uh, the, the, those burning buildings as simply choosing the dying process, the method of death. I don't see them as so much as choosing the date of their death. Yeah, right. They, they did it out of complete desperation. Complete desperation, yeah. And, and there was no hope. The people that were above where the planes hit, there was absolutely no hope for them. Yeah, yeah. So, number one, as we've said, my number one reason for being against it is that God determines the day you were born and the day you will die, not John Cahoy. Reason number two, um, it puts pressure on the elderly. It makes them think that they're a burden to society. Um, two governors of Colorado, Roy Roman, who later became a superintendent of the LA Unified, and um, Richard Lamb, both said that, uh, this was in uh, 1976, they both said that the elderly should die so that the younger people may um, uh, may, or may, may prosper or profit from it. Um, you're too young to remember, there was a movie that came out in the early 70s called Logan's Run. Yeah, I see smiles on, on Steve's face. Uh, it, it, it's a movie that answered that very question. Of, you know, everybody, once you hit 30, automatic death, <laughs> automatic termination. And Logan and his girlfriend got to 30 and they had to run for their lives. That's why the movie's called Logan's Run. I won't spoil the movie for you. Can, I'm sure you can get it on, on Netflix, but it, it is not a good idea. The other thing that bothers me about that is that what does the fifth commandment say? You shall honor your mother and father. It doesn't say you shall kill your mother and father so you can get the inheritance early. That's called the prodigal son. You know, like that, you're taking way too long to die. I you know, I want to go, you know, so, no. We have broken every commandment, very subtly. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. We have wealth. We, I don't get me wrong, I have nothing against people who are good. The, the problem isn't wealth. The problem, you having wealth. The problem is wealth having you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have one other question. You, you can tell that she's an educator, Susan. So I'm sure you're <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, Back at the beginning, you were talking about transplantation. 
transplantation. Yes. Are you against transplantation? For Gordon Glasgow personally, yes. For my patients, I've recommended it many, many times. Well, just because of the death of the other person? No, not at all. Um, it has to do with, um, yeah. Okay. Understand what you're doing with a transplantation. I'm taking something out of her and putting it in her. And her body, her immune system is going to reject it because it's not Marilyn. Okay. So, what happens is that um, I put this foreign object inside of you, and then I have to give you a drug to suppress your immune system to tell it not kill off that organ. That means your immune system is not going to be able to fight off infections as well as it could. So here's the yeah, here's the problem. You're giving her something on one hand, but you're putting her at a higher risk. Correct. On the other hand. On the other hand. Um, it almost uh, makes me, and I, and I said this to one of my professors in medical school, I said, why do we even bother washing our hands before the transplantation surgery? Because the biggest transfer of bacteria occurs when I Because you don't know what viruses she has. You know, she, she, she can have a slow virus. You know, we tend to think of viruses, oh, I got sick immediately. No, there's something in uh, <clears throat> virology called a slow virus, and that is a virus that enters your body. It might cause a minor flu or something, some like symptoms, it may cause zero symptoms. It incorporates itself into your DNA and nothing may happen to you. You pass it on to your children. And maybe then your grandchildren. But at some point, with the right exposure to the right type of agent, be it chemical, radiation, or whatever, that virus re-expresses itself. And now, your grandchildren, who are never exposed to that virus, gets, comes down with that. So my, my personal objection to it is that, as I said, why bother wash your hands before the surgery? Uh, yeah, I've already done the most dangerous transfer of all. But I understand, I said, this is Gordon's choice for Gordon's body. And probably because I know too much, uh, you know, but I have recommended transplantation for lots of people. I have no problems. You want to live, it's your life, you might have grandchildren you want to take care of. I mean, I don't know why you want to live. I, I just know you want to live, and I'm going to help you to accomplish that. Um, you don't have to agree with me, and I don't have to agree with you. A concept that I think our politicians should learn, but anyway, never mind that. Um, selfish motives may be involved, reason number three. One of the very wealthy families I had here, this gentleman was a major developer here in Orange County. He built a lot of custom homes in Corona Del Mar. So a very wealthy gentleman. He was in his 80s when I took care of him. This is, again, I'm talking, I was in my 30s back then, you know, so. And he uh, came into the hospital. He had something called a brainstem stroke. It's the worst type of stroke imaginable. He was in a state of coma. And there was a young lady with him who uh, was obviously in her 40s, and she was obviously wife number X. You know, I, I don't know what number she was, but he had many wives that I knew, and that she was the you know uh, newest, youngest, blondest version of whatever. And um, she, you know, she came into me and she said, uh, she said, uh, uh, I want you to do everything to keep my husband alive. He is, he's so important to me, he's so precious to me, that I can't even think of life without him. And I said to her, I said, well, I, I appreciate that, and I will keep that in, under consideration, but um, the paperwork I have says that his, his eldest daughter is the power of attorney, and so I have to get her opinion. So I call up the daughter, she lived in Arizona, and I said, um, you know, your dad just had really the worst kind of stroke imaginable, and what would you like me um, 
to do because I said I spoke to your mother and you're, she wants you know that to live. I, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> I know, but you know, what I said to her was, "Mother." There was a cold silence on the oh, phone, I'm... and then she said, "Don't you ever call that witch my mother?" <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know who's not going to be invited to her wedding. <laughs> and so she said, that woman has no say in this. She, I want my dad to die a natural death as quickly as possible. The reason, the way the will was written, it gives the daughter sole discretion. Wife number X was contesting the will in court, and if he died before the, now you get it. So why why is Gordon against assisted suicide? Because I ran into many situations like this in my practice. Um, selfish motives. Okay, um, mistakes can be made. You know, of the forty people that Jack Kevorkian helped to uh, to uh, assisted in the in the death. 24 of them did not have a terminal illness. Three of them had no illness at all, period. Now you understand? Okay. And, you know, I, I went into that in, in some detail because I think I, I wanted you to understand. The, the euthanasia movement is saying, just hurry up and die, quickly, quickly. That is the plea of Satan. Hurry up and die before you figure out what the Bible is saying to you. Now you understand why. So when people come to me and say, chapter 9 in Revelation is the most horrible chapter. It shows an unmerciful, uncaring, unloving God. Wrong. You are not looking at, at, at what the text says. The text God is not allowing them to die because he's giving them an opportunity to hear the gospel and to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Uh, I disagree with the statement uh, to that people says we have a constitutional right to, um, to, uh, uh, to end our life. I'm not a lawyer but I just don't think the Constitution actually says that, number one. And number two, I don't care what the Constitution says. God says, you know, God will determine the day you die. So we can now go into chapter 10. Uh, uh, and it uh, and begins chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw, this is a direct quotation from the King James Version. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. So in the midst of all this terrible darkness and death and pain and suffering, God sends a messenger of light. Clothed with a cloud, continuing the quotation, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voice. Uh, I'm sorry, uttered their voices, plural. Okay, there are a number of very excellent Bible teachers who will tell you that this angel is Jesus himself. And I understand why they say that, um, the word angel, angelos in the Greek, is simply the word messenger. That's all it means. So, in that sense, I understand why they say that, because Jesus is messenger sent from God to tell us about the mercy and grace of God and the salvation that he bought for us at great price. God created us. And it says Jesus was the one that was responsible for all creation. He created us. And then, like the little girl that lost her gingerbread, gingerbread doll, and she found it inside of a store for sale, she went inside and she bought the gingerbread doll that she made. So first she made it, 
and she went in and she bought it. Jesus bought you out of the story. Okay. Um, I do not believe, however, that this is a, 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 this is the correct view. I understand why people think that. Um, and as I've told you many times before, I will always defend your right to be wrong about things. But, uh, uh, I think what, what you're seeing here is something very similar to what you see, what we saw in, um, in Exodus 34, where when Moses had an encounter with God, what happened to his face when he came down off the mountain? Right. And in fact, he had to put a veil over his face. I think that's what this is describing here. Um, I think the more time you spend with God, there is a glow. You can use the term happiness if you want. I don't like that term. But there is a glow. There is a peace. There's an incredible peace that overcome, overcomes you when you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You're no longer... Okay. There are many people here that can tell you they've experienced that peace. You're not worried about the future. You say, well, when are you going to die? Wonderful, I'm going through that doorway to eternity. I'm not worried about it. As I said, it is not death that scares me, death the destination. It is the process dying. Uh, so I, I believe that this angel is uh, exactly what it says, an angel of God. I do not believe it's Jesus Christ, but, you know, I don't believe that agreeing with me or arguing with me makes a bit of difference. Uh, and whatever you want to believe is fine with me because it doesn't affect the fundamental thing. Again, what if I told you repeatedly is the main thing? Jesus Christ is the main thing. Nothing more than Jesus Christ. Nothing less than Jesus Christ. Nothing else but Jesus Christ. So keep the main thing. The main thing. Okay, going on to verse four, verse 10, uh, chapter ten of Revelation. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, "Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not." So the question is, what did they utter? <coughs> now, if you ask Joseph Smith. Uh, Mary Baker, Eddie, or Baker, Eddie Baker, whatever her last my husband was, um, uh, they will tell you that they know what it is. The Bible is fundamentally clear here. No one knows, yes. You know, it's like the people who tell me, I know when the rapture will occur. <laughs> and I said, tell me what day it's not going to happen. Yeah, tell me that. Um, so, uh, I, I think, you know, as I told you before, the Bible is not everything there is to know about God. It's everything you need to know in order to make a decision about Jesus Christ. In other words, if you say, I read the Bible and I can't make up my mind about Jesus Christ, you have a problem. Everything you need to know to make a decision is in this Bible. And so I'm not worried about what I don't know, and I don't worry about what is written and what is sealed up. That's, you know, that, that's not important. If God doesn't want us to know, there's a reason. Revelation um, uh, chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, this is referring back to the angel in verse 4, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that lived forever and ever who created heaven now you see why I don't believe that that angel right. he lifted up his, his hand for he that liveth forever and ever and created heaven and the things that are therein and he also created the earth and the things that are therein the sea and the things which are, are therein that there should be time no longer. Uh, the word time in here is the Greek word chronos, from which we can, uh, they actually spell it with a kappa, a K, but it's, uh, in English we spell it with a C, and that's where we get the, uh, the mechanical term, chronometer, okay? Um, uh, uh, 
it, it can mean time. In fact, there is a, uh, uh, there is a uh, company that's based right here in San Diego. Um, uh, there. They, man they manufacture, uh, you've heard of Kronos, they manufacture the modern time clocks, you know, the ones where you swipe your card and it goes straight to payroll right away. Um, uh, they, they spell it, I think they spell it with a K. Uh, Kronos just simply means time, or it could mean delay, and I think in this particular case, the term Kronos means delay. In other words, God is saying, we're running out of time here. There'll be no more delay. But that's in effect what verse 5 and 6 is saying. <coughs> that is the answer to our prayer. Thy kingdom come. Um, it says furthermore, it says, Peter gives us the reason why there is, has been a delay. Why from the time Jesus left the earth after his first visit as a man, and notice I said as a man, because Jesus had it, there are several uh, pre-incarnate um, uh, uh, versions of Christ uh, uh, in, in, that is quoted in the Hebrew Testament. Um, this is saying, this is Peter's explaining why God has been so patient. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering. Not willing that any should perish. God wants you to understand that Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the only answer to all issues and problems. He's given you time to recognize that. And he's, he's basically saying that none should, uh, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is from 2 Peter chapter 3. <laughs> Verse 9. By the way, if you read two verses before that, there's a sound piece of advice in there for husbands. It said, Husbands, live with your wives with understanding. The message, you're not going to understand them. So you just have to put up with them. And vice versa. But notice he gave the advice to who? Yes. <laughs> okay. I just mentioned that because uh, uh, Peter 3 7 is, uh, you know, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. Um, this, is, uh, this is important because remember, what is going on here with book of Revelation. John is sending this book to the churches that are all experiencing persecution. At this particular point in history, Domitian is sitting on the throne of Rome. And he was one of several waves of persecution against Christianity. And they were seeing their loved ones die, they were seeing their, ch their children die, and very often in that era, if a man was killed, his wife and children were killed with him because they had no means of support. And you know, the women didn't work. I mean, and that's an era where it was all men were the sole breadwinners. And um, very often, uh, they would kill the, the, the wives and children. You say, well, thank God we're not like that. Have you been to North Korea lately? Yeah, think about that. There's a gentleman here at the Thames uh, uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. He was a, a major in the North Korean army. He was uh, also in charge of the Praetorian Guard, meaning the people that directly guard uh, Kim Jong-il, the one I like to call Kim Jong mentally ill. <laughs> Uh, the father of the current dictator. He, uh, one day he finds himself being arrested by the secret police and he didn't know what he did. Turns out that his father, his real father, not the man he thought was his father, his real father was suspected of being in a plot to kill Kim Jong-il and he was executed. 
of course, I'm sure the trial was very fair, but he was executed literally on the spot. His wife somehow was, was not picked up and she went into the countryside, married another man, took on his name. Uh, he adopted the son and when the son grew up, he went into the military, got into the Praetorian Guard and he thought he was safe. He was fortunate enough that he was able to escape from prison and made it to Thailand through China and eventually uh, made it to the United States. So when you say that sounds real primitive and, and cruel and mean-spirited that they would kill the relatives of a guy that's accused of treason, do you think if you committed treason against Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin that your relatives are going to live? Do you really think that? How different are we from the savages of ancient times? Not much. Not much different. Yes. Oh, a few minutes. Oh, thank you. I'm glad one of us is paying attention. Um, we're going to stop there, and I'll give you the uh, uh, update. Uh, uh, let me put a little note here. Okay. Um, today is uh, it's the, it's the fifth, today's the fifteenth, uh, right? Yeah. So that would be the 22nd. Uh, OK, a um, couple of things. Um, George uh, Green, who was supposed to address us last week, except uh, I was off ill, um, he's going to come next week because he had something to do this week to, to uh, give you an update as to what's going on. Um, Susie knows about this, but it'd be George Green is kind of leading uh, the charge on um, getting um, people to uh, and we're, at this point in time, we're looking at the mega, what I call the mega buildings, the, the, you know, the people that can afford you know, six figures easily, to make contributions. And you might know some of these people. Either you work for them or something. Again, you don't have to be a member of this church to, uh, to make a donation against some of that. But we're looking to do that. And we're starting first with the people who have the means. I mean, well, some of us do and some of us don't. And then later on, we will go to the, uh, to the congregation of Lodge. But George is going to come and discuss that with you in some detail. Um, with regards to what's going on in, in, uh, in Israel, um, uh, I'm sure you heard of the very daring raid that occurred this week. Um, Israel, uh, uh, using the Air Force, uh, bombed the access roads and bridges to a quote-unquote research facility in Syria. And having isolated the building, uh, the, uh, some helicopters moved in under Air, uh, Air Force cover, and several uh, commandos landed, went into the building. Most, there were very few buildings above ground. There were like three buildings above ground. There's a massive complex into the mountain. Uh, uh, and the Iranians are very good at building this because it's hard to bomb it from the air. And that's why Israel sent in ground command. They went into the building, retrieved, they killed a number of uh, Syrians and Iranian um, guards. Uh, Iran says there were no Iranians in, in, in the complex. You can take that any way you want. And that they um, retrieved tons of documents, laptops, and, uh, and then they wired the place, uh, the underground portion, the portion that was in the mountain, they wired it for explosives. And as they took off, they detonated all the explosives. So the entire underground complex was literally leveled. Uh, it has set uh, 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 the Syrian program back significantly because it took years to build that, uh, that complex. And uh, Israel has been unable to bomb it from the air because of the way it was constructed. Um, they're now analyzing all that data. Um, they have been, and again, Israel continues to eliminate uh, many of the top commanders uh, in both Hamas and Hezbollah. Their intelligence is just absolutely incredible. It kind of reminds me of the story in, in, in the Old Testament where the Syrians come in and they, t they capture people from the northern tribes, take them to Syria, and, the, and um, Hadad, the, the, the Ben Hadad, the, the, the then king of Damascus said, somebody in my midst is a spy because everything I do the Jews seem to know about it before we even get there, and they defeat us. He said, somebody in here is a spy. 
And the guy, uh, one of his advisors said to him, no, there is no spy. There is a man in Israel called Elisha, and he speaks to the one true and living God. And that God knows your very thoughts in your bed, meaning like in your bedroom. He's in your bedroom and he knows what you're thinking. And he, said, he then sent an army to capture Elisha. It didn't work. The bottom line message is this. God has promised in Amos chapter 9, verse 15, that when he brings them back to the land, they will not be moved. They won't. How many attempts have there been to eradicate the Jews out of the land of Israel? Too many to count. How many of them have succeeded? Now that's an easy account. Zero. They will not give up, but they're not getting the message. God is sending them many messages, and they're not getting it. So I think eventually God is going to have to hit them over the head, which is what I think is the Ezekiel 38 is about. I think it will start with, as I told you before, with Isaiah 7, chapter 17, the prophecy in verse 1, and then, of course, the prophecy that's in uh, Ezekiel 38. That these people will not learn. The people of the world will not learn. They're going to have to learn the hard way. I have a question. Yes. Does Israel have stationary satellites? They, they have both. Did I answer your question? Yes, they do. If yeah. you could actually read, you know, printed material from a satellite now. Yes, but the, the material that Israel uh, took out of that complex was material that would be hard to get their what hands I mean on. Is they, they know where things are based on. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They knew exactly where to go to, to get inside uh, where the entrance was to this facility. Yeah. So that, that's where we are. They have, as I said, continued to eliminate the heads of the both organizations. Of the, I think, top 25 commanders in Hamas, there are only three left alive, one of which was Sinwar. The number two and the number three person in Hamas has been killed. I don't know what it will take for them to get the message. Be that as it may. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for your time, young, uh, young people. Mm -hmm. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you because your word strengthens us. It tells us what to expect. We are not surprised. We are not afraid. We know you are the one true and living God. There is none like you. And that we are confident that your message is the correct message. And we are going to take that message to as many people as you bring across our pathway each and every day. Lord, help us to share the great news of Jesus Christ with the people you give us in front of us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go out there and share the gospel. Yeah. Oh, I'm